by speaking to you tonight, I'm actually breaking one of my golden rules. So I need to make the most of my time. I'm sure when you look at these photos, you recognize one of these young people or more who are changing the world. But when you look at these photos, do you recognize any of these young people who are also changing it? And have you ever heard someone say, or perhaps you've said it yourself, that youth are the future? They're the future citizens and future leaders, future decision makers. And how many of you would say that for someone to want to work with teenagers and young adults, they must be a little bit crazy, right? I mean teenagers. They're loud, unmotivated, they're rude, they have a mind of their own, and they're willing to speak it. Now, when I look out at the world, I see young people changing it every day. I see them far more potential there than what most, young, uh, most adults give them. Because I see them as the inspiring innovators, pushing the limits of possibility. I see them finding new visions of a better world, where we cross traditional borders, and we uh, reassess what success means. And we live in harmony with nature and people. I also see them changing the political landscape, if you look at some of the most recent elections, you'll see that the youth voice is making a difference. And as Greta has said, change is coming, whether you like it or not. But I still have the feeling that we prefer to see them, but not really listen to them. That we want to empower them, but only as long as they do what we want them to do and say what we want them to say. In fact, I'm asked quite often, um, how, you know, we believe in empowering young people, but how do you get them to carry your message and carry your signs? Involving youth, most likely due to Fridays for Future, is much the trend these days. And on one hand, that can be seen as a positive thing, giving young people a platform to speak, a chance to gain experience, a chance to raise their voice. On the other hand, it can also be used, and youth can be manipulated. To give you a few examples, in Vienna I just saw an advertisement for open a, blank, a new green bank account for young people and save the planet. Or at an event, youth are invited to sing and dance, stand in the hallway, but are they invited to the stage? Or the classic tree planting photo op. An organization says, we're going to empower some youth by planting some trees. So they contact the mayor, they organize the shovels, they organize the trees, and they contact the press. The day comes, the youth arrive, they get a shovel, they're told to dig here, here, and here. The trees are put there, they cover it up, the photo's made, job's done. And what have the young people learned? How to dig a hole. Yes, it's important to involve and engage and empower youth. But the question is, are we doing it to check the box? Is it a marketing ploy or a true opportunity for empowerment and growth? Now, I'm what you call a youth worker, and yes, that makes me a little bit crazy, but I see it as an incredible opportunity for growth and learning and challenge. I get to work with an inspiring number of young people around the globe, and it's a constant assessment for me to know, do I step in or step back and let go of control? And oftentimes, that's the best thing I can do. It's also an ego check, whether I see their success as my success 
and how others see me. It's also realizing that trying can mean failing, and that's okay. And it's a recognition that there's not one youth, that they're all individuals with different needs and desires, strengths and weaknesses, and we cannot speak to the youth. Now, I need to take you on a little journey with me so that you can follow me on how some of these ideas were formed. I grew up in North Carolina, in the southeastern part of the United States, but moved around from coast to coast, from California to Washington, D.C., to Seattle, Washington, and finally to Alaska. And it was in Alaska that I felt that I had finally made it. I could wear my favorite pair of hiking boots and jeans to the office. I felt connected to the people, the place, and the work that I was doing. And the work that I was doing was working with the Environmental Protection Agency and four Alaska Native tribes. As you heard, it was a community-based environmental program. And for me, it was a great learning opportunity because I realized that I could learn as much, if not more, from the people in the villages than they could learn from me. It was also a paradigm shift from the typical government approach. We're from the government, we know your problems, and we know the solutions to identifying what the community needs and developing the capacity to address them. Now, at the same time, I had an opportunity to meet a handful of young people, and they changed my life forever. The story goes that in the late 90s, there were six young women from Kodiak Island and Anchorage, Alaska. They were sitting at a Congress, and they looked around the room, and they realized that there was something missing. There were no youth-led environmental programs for people of their age, and there was a great need to get active for their local communities, for the air, the water, the land, their traditional foods, the fish, and much more. And so what did they do about it? Well, they founded an organization, and they called it Alaska Youth for Environmental Action. They organized trainings and events and projects. Now, this was a complete awakening for me. It was something that I had never experienced before. It was not how I had been taught as an environmental educator to come in and spread my information, because here the youth were leading the, the way. And what I realized is, at that age, no one had asked me, what do you want to learn about? What do you burn for and want to take action for? And what skills do you need to be an active citizen in a democratic society? And what was more is that these young people weren't just talking about problems, but they were getting active and changing things. I saw them get active to reduce pesticide spraying in their schools, to address air pollution in their communities, and to take on the cruise ship industry and address the dumping of wastewater in their fishing areas. They met with politicians on both sides of the aisle, bent their ear, and gained their respect. They crossed cultural boundaries and reached out across the urban and rural divide. And in 10 years, they had reached over 5,000 youth in 150 different communities in the remote state of Alaska. Now, I'm sure if you had been in that situation, it would have changed your life as well. Now, fast forward a few years. And I found myself no longer in the Alaska range, but in the Austrian Alps. Drawn by love, I packed my bags once again and headed out across the big ocean. Needless to say, it was another life-changing experience. Arriving in Innsbruck, I realized that I was starting from ground zero again. Not being able to speak the language, no one knew the university I'd gone to or the degree I had, they didn't know the employer who I'd worked for, and working with Alaska Natives was not exactly the top skill desired in Austria. <laughs> so I had to recreate myself and determine a new path. Now, luckily, what I still had was the burn to work with young people and active citizenship. Now, luckily enough, I'm a very stubborn person. And I kept going back to WDF Austria and saying, 
I'd like to do something with you. And they finally gave me a volunteer job to correct English text and translate. But that finally led to a position where I was working on a European project where we were developing curriculum for schools and I was able to bring the act of citizenship and working with youth together again. Now, the next thing that happened was almost like a dream come true. I was invited to join the education team of WWF and make an elevator pitch about the program in Alaska and whether they could integrate it into Austria. And they said, yes. So we gathered some financial support and we put out a call. We're looking for young people who would like to develop with us a youth environmental program. And they came. In that first year, we started with seven youth. And we developed the vision that we want to create a network of young active citizens to develop a more fair and sustainable planet. Now, that was 10 plus years ago that we started Generation Earth. And ever since then, we've been developing life-changing, powerful programs for youth in Austria and beyond. Now, we took a lot of the experience and wisdom from, from Alaska, but we adapted it to our own needs. And we built it around various principles, such as youth empowerment. We don't develop programs for youth. We develop them with youth. Peer-to-peer -peer learning. We train youth to become trainers of other youth action-oriented. We don't talk about problems, we do it. Respect for differences. We strive for diversity. Nature connected. We find inspiration and motivation in the natural world. And community spirit. One of the main things that we can do is to create a safe space for young people to take off their masks, to be themselves, to try new things, and to join us on a journey that's both an individual one as well as a group one. Now, you might be wondering, okay, that sounds great and all, but how does it actually work? So I'm gonna let you in on a few secrets, but not all of them. So first of all, we start with creating the community and the team. We start by getting very personal and getting to know each other at an individual level, building relationships, team building, trust building, nature rituals, that connect the team. We then move into the most exciting part for me, and that's the learning part. What's very different about our program from any other else is that I never know where we're going before we start with the group, because the participants decide on the learning program. Now, how does that work? Together, we brainstorm and prioritize the themes around three main categories leadership skills and active citizenship, project design and project management, and environmental topic like this year, climate protection and sustainable diets. Now what's next is the youth don't just come up with the ideas, but then they get involved in actually planning and implementing the trainings with us. Last but not least, of course, is the getting active component. What's really important for us is to keep it at a level where they don't feel like they have to be perfect, but we see it as an experiment to set a goal, to try it out, and see what happens. We don't restrict them from what they do. We give a theme, example, sustainable diets, and they come up with a concept themselves. Whether they're more interested in arts, communications, political engagement, that's their choice. It's always exciting and it's always changing and it never gets old. Only I do. Now, as we are stand sitting here listening to some important people speaking, and we're about to enjoy some nice refreshments, under 2,000 kilometers from here, there are decisions being made that will not only affect your lives, but the lives of countless generations to come. And as Greta said, we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. 
And as long as the leaders are going to act like children, then the children will need to act like leaders. I wonder if in those closed door sessions, if the decision makers have listened to the scientists and the youth and what they've been saying for years. And because I couldn't bring youth with me onto the stage tonight, I brought some to speak with you by video. I would ask that you listen carefully to the message that they have for you and decision makers in Glasgow and beyond. If we've learned anything from the COVID pandemic, it's that rapid change is possible. And so, as we await the outcome of the COP26 negotiations, I hope to see that our world leaders will have made the necessary commitments to turn the tide on climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And I'm hopeful because I know that youth around the world have mobilized and had their voices heard, and I hope that they've been listened to by our leaders. Specifically at COP26, we need to ask, what are the impacts of today's solutions on tomorrow's planet? so as to create legislation that ensures my generation can live in a more sustainable future. We need to do more to save millions of species of animals and plants, and also to save us from extinction. We depend on nature, so please let's create a change and a better world together. I demand from the world leaders on COP26 that they switch from the regular conference mode to an emergency conference mode when negotiating. We need to go to another scale when negotiating about um, climate action because we can no longer afford that not every country is part of the game. Amazing to see young people from across Africa working towards amplifying the voices that we have and uh, working towards the environmental protection. It is so nice. But you know what? We cannot do it alone. That's why we call upon different stakeholders, private sectors, uh, you know, and uh, the government to come together and work with us. And of course, without forgetting the decision makers, because we, we, we push agendas as young people. But if it is not recognized by decision makers, then there's nothing we're doing. We call upon different decision makers from across the globe to work with us so that we can be able to push the agenda forward. We can be able to bring the change that we want as young people. So thank you. Thank you for listening carefully to those voices. And if I can ask you one more request, the next time you hear someone say, youth, the leaders of tomorrow, if you would please correct them and say, I think you mean youth, the leaders of today. Thank you very much.